it's indeed, uh, uh, for me, uh, something very, very meaningful to be here. Of course, it's the 20th uh, anniversary of the very sad uh, event of the death of uh, Professor De Giorgi, but it's also, for personally, quite uh, a remarkable anniversary because it's the 40th year since uh, I arrived in Pisa. So in fact, I arrived in Pisa as a student of the Scuola Normale in 1976. And uh, in about that time, I had the privilege, of course, of talking to Professor De Giorgi. Myself, I was, uh, at, the mo at the time, I was a computer scientist. I, 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 I wanted to study computer science, which indeed was what I did. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, very early on, in the very early days uh, of my staying at the Scuola Normale, I had two extraordinary experiences. One was that of meeting Professor De Giorgi, and the other one was an extraordinary lecture that Professor Forti gave on uh, set theory. And that actually made me think that probably I, could, I should reconsider my decision. So, I went to talk to Professor De Giorgi and asked him, and I told him, well, look, I would like to study computer science. It's uh, some, you know, at the time, in 1976, uh, uh, can you imagine, we still had, uh, uh, I mean, of course, you didn't have laptops. I mean, it was all uh, uh, in, uh, um, I don't even remember the, the words that, that we uh, directly used, but it was all working in batch, in batches. You had to wait for the whole night. You used to submit your cards uh, in the evening and in the morning you would have your, the output of your program for the, in Via Santa Maria, the, the big computer that was there. So I, I, I said, what should I do? I told, I asked Professor De Giorgi and he said, well, first you study mathematics, he told me, and then you can go on to computer science. And this is precisely what I did. In fact, I didn't study mathematics, I studied logic and foundations of mathematics, but uh, this is exactly the, my, my history. So, uh, as, as you can see from, I just wrote a little biography here, what is really relevant, uh, I think, is this. My, I, I received my laurea degree in the academic year 7980. And I, I, before, before then, I was rector of the University of Udine. Uh, but the, uh, the way, I am professor of automata theory, but it's, I, the reason why I put it down is because at the time, in Italy, in 1990, you uh, received uh, your, you were nominated professor. You had, uh, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, an exam in, um, in, in Rome. No, well, no, 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 there was no exam for, for the uh, full professorship. Uh, but you had to submit your papers, and then you received a, a, a telegram. You know, telegrams don't even exist any, anymore, I think. You just have an email. So, so you, you got this telegram, and uh, I was appointed uh, professor of uh, theory of atoms, not a, a automata, because there was a spelling mistake. Uh, uh, so, so can, you, can you imagine, I mean, how, well, I mean, uh, how uh, automata, it wasn't even something that people conceived as being a, 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 a topic of... Uh, of, uh, uh, okay, well, th that's it. So uh, after that, I have uh, probably, I would say, also influenced by uh, the standing of uh, Professor De Giorgio, as you, as you will see, I will mention it briefly. Had a, he had a very uh, um, uh, convincing commitment uh, to... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say uh, poli politics, because he was not involved in politics, but I would call it rather active citizenship. For him, being a citizen was indeed, a, an active citizen was indeed a duty. It wasn't something that uh, uh, you, you did uh, sort of uh, in your, uh, uh, once uh, your work was done. I mean, it was, it was indeed a duty. And probably this influenced me uh, quite a bit. In fact, I, I, uh, as I remember, I was elected representative at uh, the Board of Administrators of the Scuola Normale for, uh, my, during my time here. And then, of course, I, gra gradually in my, in, my, in my lifetime, I even decided at some point to run as, as mayor of the city as a, as a service to, 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 to the community. Of course, as the, and it's indeed extremely difficult. Can you, you can, I presume you, you can imagine, but I, I, that would be another story. So, um, uh, okay, so here this is the abstract. So just, this is just to say that, uh, 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 no, uh, uh, how do I go? Uh, 
uh, I, I, something has come si torna indietro okay so uh, well, as usual it's best to uh, okay so um, uh, th th this is to say just that uh, this is a joint work with uh, some of my former students uh, in the University of Udine and now they all run uh, the research on their own, but we still do some active research uh, together. So uh, I wanted to address first uh, uh, the George's philosophy of uh, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, because I think that uh, it is something worthwhile uh, investigating. It has a bearing, I think, on everybody's attitude towards mathematics and uh, uh, foundations, and there is still quite a bit, I think, to, to, to explore and to understand. So I, here I, I call it Platonism and impredicativism. Now, um, uh, predicativism is an attitude uh, whereby you can only define a, an object uh, uh, only, uh, you cannot define an object uh, referring to uh, some kind of entity which presupposes the existence. So, in uh, predicativists uh, wouldn't really define uh, uh, least upper bounds uh, or uh, because this is defined in terms of, uh, of a larger uh, collection where such an entity already exists. So this was an attitude at the beginning of last century in the foundations of mathematics. Well, De Giorgi was precisely the opposite. He was an impredicativist. And the reason why he was an impredicativist, I will try to explain in the next few slides. But first, uh, let me just mention another essential topic, which is uh, he advocated the sapiential value of mathematics, or the sapiential function, uh, sapiential or uh, the wisdom. But, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, here are some examples of what he meant by sapiential virtue. First is uh, humilta, so uh, humility or a humble attitude. Uh, then speranza, hope. And uh, the third one is uh, convivialità. He referred to Dante's convivium, conviviality. But of course, this is really very close uh, also to Popper's attitude as far as science uh, and as, as far as uh, the reliability of science. It's only the larger epistemic community which uh, uh, grants certainty to, to, to or scientific uh, validity to your argument. So, this, uh, so that's why he would always want people to react to what he said. I remember many, many of his papers said, well, I am here just giving a few suggestions, but really this is just a hint for people to, uh, to, uh, to, to react. Of course, he wouldn't really let you react because, of course, when he would start speaking, then it would be, have been quite difficult to stop him. But, but in, in principle, his, his attitude was precisely that. And then here are some, another example of uh, the sapiential value uh, of, of mathematics is, uh, uh, of course, the axiomatic method. And we will come back to that. Uh, he often quoted uh, the, uh, the, the uh, universal the declaration of uh, the human rights, uh, universal declaration of human rights, uh, and that was an example of an axiomatic uh, uh, system, much as uh, piano arithmetic or Zermelo Frankel set theory. But, uh, but even, of course, uh, the, the uh, uh, the book, the book of Proverbs from the Bible or from other sapiential books uh, from the Bible, again, there were examples of axiomatic systems for him. And another point is capitalizing for, uh, on failures. This for him was again a very, very clear indication of the sapiential value of mathematics. Ma mathematics had a sapiential function because it allowed you to build on your failures. So there is a little bit of uh, this fallibilistic uh, uh, vision of in his epistemology that also, I mean, proper. Mm. Of course, as I say here, his philosophy of mathematics was rooted in his religious attitude. He was very religious. His ethical uh, standpoint, I remember discussing him in, in, the, in, the, in 1990, you know, when uh, there was the United Nations intervention, first intervention in the Gulf War. And uh, 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 we were debating whether it was uh, legitimate or not to, to intervene 
in uh, the uh, uh, in, 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 in the Gulf. Uh, and, yeah. Well, uh, his human rights uh, activism. He was very, very uh, active uh, in uh, Amnesty International. You might uh, uh, know very well about this, but really uh, I, I want to stress it because I don't think that uh, uh, one should forget uh, in considering his work, his moral and ethical uh, standpoint. Uh, and his epistemological view. And as I say, or was it the other way around? I mean, it was the philosophy of mathematics that was uh, rooted in his religious attitude, or was it the other way around, rather, his religious attitude rooted in mathematics? Well, we, we, we don't, as you know, we don't know. And all this are, are interesting for understanding the topic that uh, basically I will try to address this morning, that is self-description which again was a running theme in his work. So here I have some interesting quotations from him because I really want to, to get this point right through to, to all of you if you uh, allow me to do so. So the first sentence, uh, you can read it in Italian for those of you who know Italian, otherwise I'll read it in English. So he said, as a mathematician, in order to be able to speak of what I know, I need to refer to what I know not. So this is typically the impredicativist attitude. It's not that you can build in a constructive way from nothing. So the, the mysterious nature of the foundations of mathematics. So you see, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, uh, mathematics, which supposedly it's the most, uh, uh, it's the paramount example of certitude, certainty, is rooted in mystery which is precisely the foundation. And I, I will get back to that. And now, mi limiterò a notare, I will limit myself to, uh, to remark that in mathematics, uh, uh, even if you want to limit yourself in uh, fini finitistic processes, as, say, Hilbert wanted, you still have to allow for rules which are not finitistic. For example, in order to define addition, here I am translating, uh, uh, you are sort of morally forced to speak about uh, integers. And uh, uh, in, in general, you can describe certain objects uh, only allowing for more complex entities uh, that uh, allow you to describe these objects. So you see, it is precisely the opposite. So it's not that he was an impredicativist. I mean, he was truly an impredicativist. And, uh, of course, you can then question what was this starting point. But I have uh, highlighted here uh, in boldface, limiterò e limitare, because this is a repetition. Now, I have to say something about this. His legendary prose uh, and the mannerism of speech. Now, this was the title of my dissertation in my first year in the Perfezionamento program. Uh, listen to it in Italian. Delineare le linee fondamentali dei fondamenti della matematica. So, outline the fundamental lines of thought, of course, of the foundations of mathematics. So, there is a repetition. And now, look, at the, this is another introduction. Uh, I will say that in Italian. Nella nota, espongo nella forma più chiara e sobria. No, of course, he could have used just clear. In this note, I outline in the most clear and sober. Of course, clear would have been enough. But it was clear and sober uh, uh, possible. Uh, ideas che, che mi sembrano abbastanza nuove, which appear to me, you see, his humbleness, which appear to be. You could say, which are. Well, no, uh, appear to me to be, appear to me to be, and then you have this uh, anaphoras, uh, abbastanza nuove, sufficiently new, abbastanza interessanti, sufficiently interesting, abbastanza comprensibili, uh, sufficiently understandable. So there is this anaphora, anaphoric repetition of abbastanza, 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 and then again you would stop, abbastanza comprensibili, no, he went on, comprensibili, discutibili e criticabili. So can, can you say, so uh, understandable, uh, 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 suitable to be discussed and even criticized. Hmm? Uh, by whom? Just about anybody. And, and you could stop there, but no, he went on. The parte di ogni persona who considers them. 
of course, and then you could stop again, but he would go on and say, a persona che le consideri con una certa attenzione, and then eventually he would stop. And I, I think this is a perfect example of his prose. And uh, at the time, it sounded just peculiar, although it was so detailed and uh, never, never ending. And then, of course, in later years, I, I happened to, to study more and more Dante and uh, his etymological repetitions. Uh, so here I just took uh, out a, a triplet from uh, the paradise. You know? I just took this because le fronde ove si infronda tutto l'orto dell'ortolano. It's like the linee fondamentali dei fondamenti della matematica. It's, it's uh, only that with, with Dante you would laugh. <laughs> but, but can you see there was indeed uh, some peculiar. So this is just to, by the way, just to, if you haven't uh, seen, if those of you who are uh, uh, young, I just asked here to scan, uh, yeah. So this is uh, 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 just his handwriting yeah, in a very, very um, uh, standard, uh, 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 he very, very often say after dinner, uh, you would walk with him uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, he would sit down just uh, at the Timpano Palace and he would uh, take uh, a notebook and start writing what was uh, uh, his vision of the um, beginning of mathematics. And so here, as you see, the, all the basic objects, this is really one of his uh, foundational uh, attitudes. So, uh, uh, you know, the definitions of all the basic entities, oggetto, collet uh, object, collection, operation, quality, pair, and all notation and uh, 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 it's not that he was obsessed by notation, he was not at all, but still I thought he thought it was important. So I, if any of you, I have many more of his notes, I must say that some of them I still don't fully grasp what uh, he had uh, precisely in mind. But I thought it would have been interesting for you to, for those uh, who are young enough uh, not to. Uh, um, uh, okay, so... Uh, L'ortolano eterno, so, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, here I wanted to go through some of his keywords and uh, commonplaces. So, he was anti-reductionist, and the standard quotation, probably this has been mentioned already uh, in this conference, but uh, there are, this is from Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in our, your philosophy. I don't uh, exactly know. Uh, here I wrote your, but I think there are editions uh, uh, of uh, Shakespeare that it is in our philosophy. I'm not so sure. I don't think it's, it's obvious what is, whether it's your or our. But anyway, this is a uh, uh, standard quotation. It, to which he would add, uh, there are more things in the, in the mind and the heart of people that uh, uh, more than he would ever imagine that there are. And uh, this was the attitude, this, uh, as, as he was uh, um, advocating human rights, uh, he was advocating also ontological rights of just about any entity, as I have shown you earlier. It's not just sets. It is objects, collections, qualities, relations, operations. Each of them individually is irreducible. I mean, of course, you can reduce it to, to other notions. We know that you can reduce possibly to sets. But eventually, the, any, any sort of reduction is a kind of limitation. It's a kind of uh, 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 weakening of, of the entity. So for this reason, you have this ample theory of the Georgian 40 here who took into account qualities, pairs, numbers, relations, operations, collections, sets, functions, proposi propositions, variables, uh, or correlations. Mm. Then another very, very uh, recurrent theme was uh, the uh, uh, contrast between sophologists and philosophers. So philosophers are those who love knowledge, uh, Sophologists are the uh, uh, knowledgeable people, erudites, uh, people who uh, are just very, very knowledgeable in wisdom, but they don't love it. It reminds me of some attitudes of other philosophers, during the, especially during the French Revolution, that uh, uh, said that, the, uh, that the, the teacher should be ignorant. 
know, as a kind of provo provoca provocative. So a philosopher doesn't really need to know, he needs to love. Uh, and of course, uh, the prudential attitude, uh, this atteggiamento prudenziale in his axiomatic uh, approach. He didn't want these axioms that you don't know whether they're right uh, or, or wrong or whether they force you. He would say, well, just let's accommodate whatever sounds plausible. So always a prudential attitude, which of course it was very annoying for me. You see, I was a young uh, student who would have liked to, to test uh, his uh, talent uh, on a very difficult and proving the consistency or the independence of some very, very intriguing and novel axiom. No, no, he would say, well, no, that, that of course, I mean, you can do that, but that's not, that's not going to be all that interesting. Uh, he w was quite right in this. In fact, in the theory of, in set theory, I don't think there are many, many axioms by now that we know that are really incon inconsistent. We know that there are certain incompatibilities, but uh, it's not, I mean, he was quite right. It's, it's really, the, the theory is open-ended. And uh, the, the fact that it is open is the very, very uh, essential uh, approach. And then there is this semi-formal approach. Of course, you would think that in foundations you have to be extremely formal, as you are in writing a computer program or in writing a compiler, but he was well aware that, in fact, at best you can be semi-formal. Okay. And then another fundamental issue is uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I really wanted to quote, uh, as he used to quote it. Uh, La Dudu, the, the, that was just his acronym uh, at the time. You wouldn't use acronyms as, as, as commonly as you do today. But he, uh, and it, it was always quoted with the day of its uh, signature, of its signing. He wouldn't say the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, period. No, he would say of the 10th December 1948, uh, as if uh, this was uh, uh, part of, uh, 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 okay, so I, I uh, uh, so the, uh, as I said, his active citizenship, but his epistemology, mathematical ontology, methodology, all were, uh, uh, I think you, we can trace two, a twofold approach, which uh, really uh, I would like, it's, one was the Tuesday seminar and the other one was the Wednesday seminar. So this is the twofold approach. So in the Tuesday seminary, it would be mainly conjectures. Of course, he would also prove this would be <laughs> some of these conjectures, and, but it was more conjecturing, while uh, uh, in the Wednesday, it would be more axioms. And, we, and so I would call it uh, the Platonist uh, uh, white box approach uh, in, uh, the, the, where you would really want to you imagine such entities uh, and this universe. Uh, and uh, they would be as real as, uh, as uh, anything. And a black box approach, a more uh, prudential approach. It's a black box. We can only describe it uh, in certain ways. We are never claiming that uh, we have uh, an exhaustive uh, description of the object we want. And, and this uh, was, was the group of people who used to work, of course, Marco Forti, Tortorelli, who is here, Clavelli, I don't think he is here, uh, Lenzi is here. This was the, 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 the group of people who used to uh, actively work in an anti-predicativist approach. Now, here we come to uh, self-description. As, as, I, as I told you, the, the concept of self-description self uh, is uh, basically what brought me uh, this was, we will see the topic actually of, of my thesis. And for him, it was the starting point uh, of the foundations of mathematics. Which, but of course, uh, self-description is, is quite uh, mysterious. So we all know that uh, extensionality plus comprehension, you know, because of Russell's paradox, is, uh, is uh, inconsistent. Uh, uh, extensionality, uh, now, the, uh, equality, there are two ways in which you can define equality. One uh, is uh, Leibniz's principle, which is normally used. Uh, two things are equal if they belong to, 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 to uh, uh, all possible uh, qualities. And pros uh, this is, dates back from, uh, from uh, Leibniz, but uh, it is the one that we use uh, in, uh, in all... Uh, in, in my, in my later career, we built a lot of interactive uh, 
proof development environments uh, based on uh, intuitionistic type theory and, and all this. And of course, equality is normally always taken in a very basic way as Leibniz equality. Uh, and, but there is also the other, extensional equality, which is sort of uh, the, the other way around. Uh, two things are equal uh, if uh, they have the same uh, elements. This is uh, much, much stronger. And of course, the standard solution was predicativism uh, for, for uh, um, overcoming the crisis brought about by Russell's paradox. But of course, for the Georgi, this was absolutely intolerable that having predicativism, as I have tried to argue earlier, he was an impredicativist from the... Uh, and uh, of course, this is the famous sentence of David Hilbert uh, uh, that he um, sta uh, said, uh, well, allegedly said in uh, 1924, I think. Uh, he said, of course, um, Cantor has built this paradise and no, no one... Ha uh, can, uh, can, uh, 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 must not be able, uh, must not be able, no, nobody must not be able to, to chase, a, chase us away from this uh, paradise. And so the Georgia also tried to rebuild this paradise and uh, what I have been working in recent years was, is precisely building, a, implementing a, a proof development environment where you can do formal mathematics, which is basically what you will see at some point uh, before the end of this talk, at least uh, visually. And uh, it is uh, something that I can, uh, of course, it's not a paradise, but you can uh, work in this uh, with a rather fast and loose attitude. Uh, the, uh, as as uh, really in a paradise, you should because normally what has happened is that uh, in, uh, in, the fun, in logic you, you are extremely cautious. Uh, it, there, there is a huge bureaucracy. And uh, on the other hand, uh, in the paradise, you should uh, reason fast and lose. Uh, and uh, well, this is the goal. Okay. Two approaches. Uh, there were only two attempts to breach the taboo were made. And uh, uh, um, one was by Quine, it's still an open question whether uh, taking stratified formulae is consistent. And uh, the other one by Marco Forti, who uh, introduced hyper unit, well, he introduced uh, a principle whereby you can restrict to generalized positive formula in, in the late 80s, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is uh, consistent. Okay. Uh, so, I, I will discuss another way out, which is more based on proof theory, and I will address again the case uh, of who is the murderer in Russell's case. So, in Russell's paradox, who is the, really the murderer? Hmm? Uh, and uh, as, I, as I said, uh, circularities, reflexivity, non-terminating objects are ubiquitous. It is today uh, I, almost, uh, uh, un, un, it's not even understandable how, for how many decades mathematicians, logicians, they had it in front of them, uh, self-description and circular objects, and didn't want to consider them because they thought they were sort of uh, uh, in, inconsistent. Today, of course, uh, as, you, as I will show you in a short while, uh, it is uh, absolutely obvious. You couldn't do computer, computer science. Just, just think about um, the internet or, or, say, an operating system. Uh, uh, if it were terminating, it would fail. An operating system, when you know, people have considered uh, uh, termination in uh, recursive functions of for, for decades and decades and decades, and then the only function that actually is computed today is a non-terminating function, which is the internet, <laughs> uh, or it's not even a function, it's a, but, uh, or an operating system. And if it terminates, then, okay, well, that's the end of it. I mean, you've lost everything. <laughs> so, so just think about the shift uh, in uh, the mindset that has occurred uh, in the last uh, few decades. And the Georgie sort of uh, felt it already in the 80s, that you should look into circularities, you should look into reflexivity, there is a kind of a mystery. But of course, uh, he didn't want any ad hominem uh, argument to be placed uh, to be leveled against him. You know, like type theorists, for a lot of time people said type theory. But, uh, of course, everything, you, cannot, you, you can't accept something as legitimate unless it is well-typed. 
you know, all these uh, metal levels and metal levels and metal levels. But then the very notion of type uh, it doesn't have a type, otherwise it doesn't work. So, so th this is a typical uh, argument that he didn't want to accept. So, but of course, he, w the, the, he didn't have the arrogance. Uh, he always said that uh, one should go back to the Timor Domini, uh, of, uh, which is the starting point of uh, wisdom of Sapienza. So his was not an, uh, okay. I just want to go through the introduction of my Lauria thesis, because again, it, it focuses on this, on the pros and on the basic principle of circularities. Uh, uh, of course, this sentence, I wrote it down because he repeated it so many times <laughs> that eventually it's like, uh, uh, so, but uh, um, uh, you see, vid, uh, uh, let me read it. Vedremo che questa vi, sorry, uh, now, how do I go back? Uh, Sorry. Senta come si va qui indietro. Ecco. Qui, eh, questo murderer, sì. Ok. Eh, allora, vede, eh, dice, poiché non è possibile assumere solo la nozione di insieme a fondamento di una descrizione della nozione di insieme stessa, alcuni autori hanno inquadrato la nozione di insieme in ambito intuitivi più articolati, mentre altri hanno scelto come intuitive nozioni. Eh, lo scopo di questa tesi, dice, è stabilire una linea naturale di passaggio da una teoria intuitiva degli insiemi ai tipi più sofisticati di teorie formali. I, I hope you understand. Uh, uh, but anyway, if you don't, uh, now comes something which is uh, the, the crucial. He, he Says. He says, the purpose of this thesis is that of establishing a natural pathway from a naive set theory to the more sophisticated kinds of formal theories. And now comes, he says, vedremo che questa via è probabilmente insostituibile, dato che gli altri tentativi apparentemente più rigorosi, mentre si scontrano con la stessa incapacità di autodescrizione con cui si scontra una teoria intuitiva degli insiemi, portano ad una comprensione ancora minore della natura sempre misteriosa di questa incapacità. Now again, it's, it's this uh, fantastic prose which I quoted uh, uh, verbatim because of course it is just, uh, you see. Mm, uh, we will see that this pathway is unavoidable since the approaches which might appear more rigorous Mm -hmm. while clashing against the same inability in self-describing uh, themselves, uh, lead all these formal uh, to an even lesser understanding of the ever mysterious nature of this very inability. So there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, reflection. So, and in fact, this is uh, the real problem. The primeval paradox is that formali the process of formalization itself is re irreducible to formalization. Whenever you teach logic, the main problem is not to once you have f formal formalized your actions. I, I remember I was involved uh, in many um, programs, uh, even at partially, uh, at some point you might remember that there was a big disaster in the European Space Agency program. Uh, and the an Ariane flight uh, dived uh, into the Atlantic Ocean a few seconds after it was launched uh, from, the, from Guyana. Uh, and then of course, uh, most of the uh, uh, research centers uh, in uh, software certification, and I was working one of them in Edinburgh, were involved in trying to see what, what had happened. Uh, in, in, in that very, uh, um, uh, <laughs> well, why there was such a big failure in this program. And, and the outcome was that uh, everything was correct, but uh, the way in which the processor, the circuitry of the processor was formalized did not uh, actually uh, corresp uh, correspond to what uh, was actually the behavior of the processor. So all the formal reasoning was perfect, but the very, very formalization of the basic behavior of the processor was clearly wrong. And, and so that's why uh, the formalization is, uh, so, so absolute certainty, you can't achieve it. At, mo at best, you can increase your faith in uh, some uh, kind of uh, uh, rely, uh, uh, in trust in, 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 in your software. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, anyway, here there's, uh, uh, let's, so self-referential and circular situations. I'm, I'm afraid that I am, of course, running out of time, so I will have to now to really, uh, see here are some quotations uh, uh, that George used to say, look, most Italian grammars are written in Italian. 
Mm. Okay. And then the collections of all the objects I thought of uh, today, all these are self-referential. And of course, and then Euc now the Euclid's definition of a point is the intersection of two lines which are themselves construed uh, as a collection of points. So, so again, uh, there is some kind of uh, circularity. Now, this was a very, very famous uh, first uh, circularity in many, many of his uh, works of the ample theory. I, know, I notice here that Marco is uh, smiling. But this is, uh, that, that, uh, this is the quality of being a quality. Of course, the quality of being a quality is the quali has the quality of, of being a quality. Hmm? So this was a typical, uh, uh, one of his axioms uh, uh, here are, uh, at some point, collections, ins is the collection of all sets, this is the, the collection of all collections. Uh, okay, okay. But of course, uh, there are many, many situations where we have circular, you see in the semantics of programming languages, web pages are, uh, are just sets of addresses of web pages. Uh, if you want to program Eratosthenes sieve, uh, you, use, you would use streams, and, uh, and then again, these are all circular objects. And of course, in uh, defining fixed point theorems, they're all circularities, the basic tools uh, in, uh, uh, even in equations. They're there. A any equation you write, it's uh, there, a uh, circularity. There's no problem. So, so why being so cautious just because of Russell? OK. In, so in mathematics, uh, uh, well, in our, our replete language, psychology, ethics, politics, they're all replete with the circular phenomena and situations. Actually, I would say that the postmodern cultural milieu is characterized by the emergence of a range of reflexive discourses. There's no way you can now go to any, um, uh, like, like here, I remember going to an, ex an art exhibition in my city. Uh, actually, it's a catalog of we, I have supported on analytic painting. And then this results in paintings which are remarkable for the self-referentiality of their language. <laughs> so by now, just anybody speaks of self-referentiality. Um, uh, there are many, many examples. Uh, and uh, here I have uh, an intriguing collection. I don't know. Uh, I would just pick one of them of this list. But they're all, I think, quite, quite interesting. Like the mise en abîme, for instance, if you're going on in Hamlet, at some point you will see that in Hamlet, uh, the mousetrap, uh, the, the actors come along and they uh, enact uh, the very uh, tragedy of Hamlet. So this is a typical, which is the mousetrap called, and this is a typical kind of a circularity. But of course, also, uh, know thyself, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, in, in, all, in epistemic logic, uh, you go about all the time in uh, formalizing, whenever you formalize knowledge uh, in uh, robots, and that, you all the time go on and on in uh, using reflexive. Uh, yeah. Here is a, is a pun, a possible definition of recursion, C recursion. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, uh, okay. Set, set membership. Now we, we come, I only have uh, probably less than a quarter of an hour, so I have to rush. Otherwise, you won't really get the flavor of what we were doing. Uh, so set membership sets are well founded. Every uh, membership chain uh, eventually has to terminate. Uh, but uh, please follow me, bear with me in this uh, little uh, paragraph. You see, if Sir Melo Frankel's set theory is consistent, then by Gödel's consistency theorem, also Sir Melo Frankel plus the axiom of choice is consistent. Okay. Then, by Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, the consistency of ZFC is unprovable in ZFC. But what does it mean if you have the axiom of choice that there must exist a model where there is no model of ZFC? But what does it mean that there is no model? The, the fact that there is no model by Gödel's second, first incompleteness theorem, one can derive a contradiction. So you have uh, a model of set theory where you can derive a contradiction. Of course, we hope that such a contradiction <laughs> doesn't have a finite length. Otherwise, we would be in serious trouble. So, but still, there is. So it must be a non-standard von Neumann integer, the length of such a proof. And if you look at what a standard von Neumann integer, this is clearly a non-well-founded set. So, so really, 
None were founded there, sets are, are there. So what we studied in the mid-70s uh, uh, was the first examples of uh, models of set theory where you could model any extensional relations with membership. Now this had been banned uh, before. The first paper we submitted uh, at the end of the 70s with Marco Forti on an attempt of providing such an axiom at the Journal of Symbolic Logic, which was uh, sort of the, the top journal in logic, uh, uh, was turned down saying that uh, the readers uh, of uh, the Journal of Symbolic Logic are not interested in uh, non-well-founded sets. Hmm? This was uh, 1979. Hmm? <laughs> of course, then we, we carried on. <laughs> uh, we published uh, uh, this, uh, I think, uh, in a paper uh, uh, of, a, of a journal that uh, was published in a country that doesn't even exist anymore, <laughs> which is uh, uh, East Germany. <laughs> so, so that was our first paper. This was in, uh, um, I think, 1980. Hmm? And, and uh, this is the, uh, the anti-foundation axiom, uh, which is basically, we called it X1 for a, a story that I don't have time here to go through, but essentially it says that uh, no matter what uh, odd shape of the membership relation, there exists a set which uh, actually is precisely uh, the graph of such uh, a relation. And uh, actually it is unique. And this uniqueness is a crucial ingredient because uh, this is an example of what is called in category theory a, co a, a final coalgebra. And uh, today, this is amazing, but uh, in 1985, uh, this axiom was quoted, I remember I went to Stanford, and uh, uh, we were mentioned uh, because they had realized that having final coalgebras was indeed quite useful in modeling many, many situations. John H. Mendy, who is now provost uh, in Stanford University, had written a book precisely on how to use the axiom X1 uh, to model the uh, liar's uh, paradox. Uh, and uh, and uh, in, in the mid-80s, uh, the, the first uh, workbench for concurrency, that, was, that is a tool that is currently used for checking circuitry and checking that automata are actually meeting their specifications is essentially based on, I wouldn't say the axiom X1, but on the principle that is behind the axiom X1, which is this uniqueness. There is a mark, because the way that we prove the consistency of such an axiom is by using, uh, by showing that something is a maximal fixed point. And uh, uh, this maximal fixed point is basically the logical tool which is used in proving that uh, Two circuits, uh, can you imagine they're just big, big and complicated graphs, are actually, have actually the same minimal automaton. So, so this is the, one of the basic tools. I mean, whenever you fly, it's of course, I'm, I am pushing it to the limit, but it's not so, so much to the limit. Whenever you land, uh, if uh, the, the wheels of your airplane uh, actually uh, are, uh, uh, come out of the, of the, of the, of the aircraft uh, automatically, it is because somewhere someone <laughs> has checked that software and has checked it, uh, uh, um, I, I wouldn't say because of this axiom, but because of, a tool, of tools which are basically uh, based uh, on this maximum principle. This is just to say uh, how in, in uh, the, 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 the story went. So the anti-foundation axiom here, there are some many, many alternate uh, formulations. I, I really don't have time to go through this. Uh, 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 as I say, the extraordinary applications of strong extensionality uh, as uh, co-algebras, uh, minimal non-deterministic automata, because membership or transition is basically the same. And so we have this maximum, which is called the co-induction principle, because there is a duality between induction and co-induction. And uh, induction is good for finite objects. Co-induction is good to reason on infinite objects. Or, uh, or uh, uh, as, as I was mentioning, an operating system that, again, is, is some kind of automaton which has to go on and on and on forever. So you can't really prove by induction. What do you prove? 
you, you, you're interested that it, in the fact that it doesn't terminate, not that it terminates, or that you reach it. You want it to go on. And so you use coin, coinduction. And so basically all formal methods are based on, uh, all, the, all formal methods for establishing behavioral equivalence of circuitry is based essentially on the notion of bisimulation, which is one of the tools that was invented at, at the time. So all life critical software is, is based on that. Uh, I could go on here and tell you more, even the interpretation function, this might be interesting, uh, in a language, in a model, you can either take this arrow to be an arrow in a category of algebras or in a category of co-algebras. So if it is in a category of algebras, then uh, the language is the initial algebra, if, uh, and so you are more language oriented. If you take it to be an arrow in the category of co-algebras, then uh, you are more interested in behaviors, and so you are behavior oriented. Uh, uh, the, this duality uh, can be explored uh, further, and essentially, uh, least on one in initial algebras, you have least fixed point uh, uh, and induction principles. You have, uh, oh, this is just one slide to tell you uh, not uh, uh, one or two papers, but uh, dozens of conferences in uh, com theoretical computer science a year, every year on uh, 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 semantics of programming languages and uh, formal methods for proving program correctness. Uh, all, uh, and, uh, but there's this duality between algebras and coalgebras. And what I really want to say is that uh, the first uh, primeval uh, Co-algebraic object is this non-well-founded set that uh, 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 we, we were studying, and uh, and uh, and uh, and th this is it. Um, even recently, here I want to thank uh, Umberto Zania from Scuola Normale, who has pointed out uh, Yves André in, in, a, in a seminar in 2014 in Paris on mathematical ontology of Alain Badiou. I don't know if you know this philosopher. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Uh, 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 he brings about the role of co-algebras. He mentions our axioms, of course, uh, and uh, says it would be very interesting to imagine in mathematics uh, where you represented a function not by its graph, but by its co-graph. A co-graph uh, is, is the symmetrized uh, graph, uh, in, a, in a sense, and it and he, he, he says uh, it's very similar to uh, the partita doppia, to the double entry, uh, double entry uh, accountant, accountancy system. And it's an example of uh, an invariance principle. But also, but you, again, a great philosopher, a great playwright, and uh, uh, he also ba is very much uh, in, uh, you know, he, he wrote this book on, where ontology is supposed to be some Melo Frankel, Gödel, Cohen set theory. Uh, and uh, uh, every ontology is uh, well founded, but uh, the concept uh, of an event is precisely what is not well founded. And there is a very, very beautiful, uh, recently there was a book by one of his students in Paris uh, on uh, 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 this uh, uh, poet that I recommend that you read. If, it's called by Mallarmé, it's called uh, Un coup de dé. Uh, 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 um, uh, throwing uh, the dice once, and it is essentially based on uh, the concept of a non-well-founded uh, universe based uh, on the concept of event. Now, now we come to implementing Cantor's paradise, which was the topic. Uh, I, I, uh, I, so the, the, the basic idea of Pravitz is simply, okay, let's take, of, of, of Fitch and Pravitz, uh, you see, in the full comprehension, uh, it is inconsistent. But uh, we, uh, what Forty and uh, Quine said, well, in order to make it consistent, let us uh, restrict the shape of the formula. Um, what Fitch did uh, in the 50s and Pravitz in the 60s uh, was to say, no, let's allow the full comprehension principle, but we allow only normal proofs. And so 
since I have been working a lot in uh, implementing uh, formal systems for logic. So this is an example of a logical system, which is a standard first order logic with just two rules. Uh, for, this is a rule for abstraction. If, uh, if a term T satisfies a formula, then T belongs to the collection of all the set of the elements that satisfy A. And this is the elimination rule. If uh, something belongs to that collection, that it certainly satisfies, satisfies that property. This is actually, this is just uh, uh, the way you deal with negation. So this is a classical double negation. And uh, so, so you go. And uh, uh, this, uh, you accept the proof only if it is normal. And it is consistent. It is consistent almost by definition because there is no, there is at least one sentence that you cannot derive and that is a falsity because there is no introduction rule for falsity. So there being no introduction rule, then you, you, all proofs are normal. The shape of normal proofs is uh, first you have a list of elimination rules and then you have a list of introduction rules. So it is consistent. And so there you have a theory. Of course, this FP, this uh, Fitz, uh, Fitch Pravitz uh, theory, has some drawbacks. Um, you, have to, you have the rule ex falso sequitur quadlibet, the duns scotus rule, but uh, modus ponens, which is a very basic rule, you can't apply because uh, if uh, you have a normal proof uh, of an implication, a normal proof uh, of the antecedent, uh, if you combine them, you don't necessarily have a normal proof especially if the conclusion of the proof of the antecedent actually is obtained uh, using the uh, um, elimination rule. Then you would have, uh, sorry, an introduction rule. So you would have an introduction and then an elimination, and so it wouldn't be normal. So modus ponens, uh, you can't check it. Uh, you ha I mean, you can't uh, take it for granted. You have to check that the proof is normal. And uh, uh, the theory actually is also para-consistent. Uh, but you see, it's not, uh, uh, it's not that having a para-consistent system is all that bad if you want to reason. Because uh, really, if you prove something, then, uh, well, uh, that is true. OK, you can even prove the opposite. But you don't have the, the ex absurdis rule which allows you to derive everything. So really, in certification, you just need to check that things go through. And uh, it, it might even be, in, your system might even be inconsistent. Of course, at the very end, you have to check that everything is consistent. But uh, when reasoning, you can reason fast and lose, so to speak. So uh, I told you that I was going to tell you who is the murderer in Russell's paradox. The murderer in Russell's paradox is the rule of contraction which mathematicians normally use uh, uh, very, very uh, loosely. That is, uh, given an assumption, you can uh, use it as many times as you want. If you allow yourself to use assumptions only once, then the system is consistent. Of course, if you take extensionality, putting extensionality amounts to enforcing the rule of contraction. Uh, I have a proof here. Uh, um, this is the proof that you can actually, but it's, it's not so interesting here. Uh, so in, in, this, in this system, uh, you, you have uh, full uh, uh, contraction, but you don't have extensionality. So in Fitch Pravitz, you do not have extensionality, otherwise it would be inconsistent. Uh, now, you have a fixed point theorem, which allows you to prove lots of things. And uh, so in, in FP, you write, uh, you prove things and define things as in a functional programming language using um, this is the definition of numerals, uh, subtraction. I mean, it, it is a universal model of computation. You can write any recursive, recursive general recursive function. So uh, 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 now, uh, th th uh, I said that I implemented such a logic, uh, and uh, I will not have time to show you what uh, uh, an, an implementation is, uh, but just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea of, uh, of what an implementation it looks like. It is a tool like that. You, you supply something, you compute, you check, and it tells you success or failure, basically. I mean, it's obvious. 
uh, <laughs> this is uh, uh, an, an example. You see, this is how the, the, the screen would look like. And uh, I, I don't think I have more time to, to go through to just show you how the, the computer screen looks like when you use such tools. OK. Um, Go back. I know. I know. I, I'm running out of time. Uh, let me just. Uh, so I, I can't uh, explain this. Uh, I just want to show uh, the connection between uh, the fitch private theory and the hyperuniverses. For those who know what the hyperuniverses are. Well, if you take the the algebra of this uh, set theory, and you quotient it out, uh, you get a hyperuniverse. Hmm. <laughs> so this theorem is basically the mathematical theorem behind all this. And uh, uh, I just want to finish up by saying that uh, uh, there is a need to build systems which allow fast and loose reasoning. And uh, even in uh, concurrency, uh, now you have what is called uh, pessimistic concurrency, a lot of bureaucracy, uh, but you're all sure that what you get is true, or optimistic concurrency. You just go about, and then if it is interesting, then you check. So well, this that I have been showing you is more on the optimistic concurrency approach, which is hope, I hope. Yeah. And uh, um, ultimately, uh, uh, the, I want to... to and uh, with a mathematical uh, statement. Uh, the hyperuniverse of Marco Forti, the first example of a model satisfying this uh, restricted uh, uh, form of comprehension, can be found in many, many, many contexts. I say it is a ubiquitous a hyperuniverse. So if you take Cantor space, essentially that is a, a hyperuniverse. Uh, if you take the solution of the metric equation, uh, you know, a, a metric space that is uh, isomorphic to the space of its uh, closed sets uh, with uh, a reduced metric, again, it's a hyperuniverse. Or uh, uh, other, if you take the maximal points of certain solutions uh, of uh, uh, SFP domains, uh, Again, this is in the semantics of programming language. Again, you get a hyperuniverse. If you take the stone model algebra over zero generators, again, it's a hyperuniverse. And the final, so this is the little contribution, or uh, the contribution of this uh, work, uh, is that uh, uh, the extensional quotient, quotient of the fitch pravitz co-algebra of this set theory is, again, yet another example of uh, this uh, uh, hyperuniverse. I, uh, I realized that uh, the last part of my talk was probably uh, not uh, at all uh, accessible, uh, even to people who uh, have heard of this already because I had to rush through so fast. But I hope that at least some keywords might have triggered uh, in, uh, in, in you some kind of uh, association of ideas. And uh, I hope that you could catch a glimpse of the history that I tried to trace uh, of uh, the George's uh, attitude uh, to history in the uh, history of ideas. Uh, uh, in the George's uh, philosophy of mathematics, uh, how he uh, uh, became aware very early about the need to address the issue of uh, uh, um, self-description, which was mysterious, and how he insisted on uh, finding axioms uh, for defining non-well-founded sets, and eventually this that was dismissed because people were uh, in the mid of the 20th century were all predicativists, in the, by the end of that century and the beginning of the century realized that uh, recursive, uh, uh, non-terminating objects, circular objects, circularities are so basic that really if we want to uh, check uh, uh, validate any form of uh, elaborate uh, uh, software, a computer program, we're more interested in non-terminating programs. And when we have to come and establish properties of such uh, 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 circular objects, uh, 
ultimately the basic tool for reasoning on such entities is precisely uh, the basic principle that we had used in proving the consistency of that axiom on non-well-founded sets. Thank you. Maybe we have time for just one short question. Please. Uh, uh, thanks for your uh, very deep and very clear uh, talk uh, lecture. I uh, only would like to remark uh, the contribution of uh, the Giorgio to the unity of the science. Unity. He said that the disciplines are uh, the part of the same uh, tree of wisdom. And uh, then uh, they are not in contradiction or then uh, there is not a discipline which is, uh, which is uh, which has a supremacy of uh, about the other disciplines. Uh, an example of this is uh, the uh, relation with the computer science. There are some mathematicians that uh, say that the computer uh, leads the algebra analysis uh, to the final steps. Instead, the, the George said that uh, the computer, the same computer, is uh, a source of uh, source of uh, fundamental and very interesting uh, problem. Another imp very important concept is the importance of insuccess, of failures. We have the example of the uh, no regularity for uh, uh, partial differential equation with uh, an higher dimension, but this uh, counter example leads to very important theory, to the very important theory of uh, quasi regularity. Then uh, uh, yeah, I will appreciate it very much uh, your uh, talk and uh, <laughs> it is a pleasure for me to say some words. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I agree that that's a, a very important uh, issue, uh, the unity of science. Uh, and he always, uh, the George, always uh, complained that uh, uh, in Italian universities, uh, um, uh, uh, now you have a separation of students. He thought it was very, very beneficial that in the old days, uh, engineering students had uh, uh, calculus and analysis courses together with mathematicians. And uh, he always uh, thought that, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, engineering and practice is the, the first source of mathematical uh, 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 problems. So, so indeed, uh, the unity of uh, of science uh, he was strongly advocated. I, I he was uh, uh, very much trying. Marco Forti did this uh, uh, I, uh, on uh, uh, in a very remarkable way when uh, he uh, they tried uh, to axiomatize uh, the basic concepts of uh, biology. And now, if you go and look at the medicine book, there the, in the last. Uh, uh, 30 years and 40 years in molecular biology uh, and cellular biology, outstanding uh, uh, advances have been made, but unfortunately the logical depth of even such principles is, uh, is not very high. And probably one of the reasons is because uh, there hasn't been yet an appropriate axiomatization of the basic concepts that underpin uh, that are underpinning all these uh, domains. So, so indeed, uh, the axiomatic method, the sapiential function of mathematics is also helping into axiomatizing. And I'm sure that uh, this will greatly help our future medical doctors or even in, in, in understanding uh, even how the brain works when someone will pursue the work that has been uh, uh, pioneered by Forti and uh, the Georgi of axiomatizing biology. Thank you, the speaker again.